and I'm Sarah James. I'm with NBC News in the United States, but I have the distinct pleasure of getting to report for the United States from Australia and cover Australia, which makes me privileged indeed. And I am based in Melbourne, just north of Melbourne. Um, and I run the Wombat State Forest Bureau, which means that I actually have a sound recording booth in my backyard north of Melbourne and get an opportunity to cover uh, the Pacific Rim and in particular Australia. So thanks very much. And I wanted to now take the opportunity to introduce our panelists for the next uh, session, which is called Common Ground. And I know this is going to be absolutely fascinating. First, we have with us Ian Walker. Now, Ian is the executive director of the New Democracy Foundation, which is here in Sydney. And I was getting a little bit of uh, coming up to speed on this from Ian. And it's really fascinating what they do. So they support uh, non partisan, non-ideological ideas, cross issues. The basic threat is that they want them to be pro-democracy. I don't know anything that's against that, uh, but we'll get into the specifics of uh, how they work on that. And they look into uh, projects and pilot programs that uh, have innovation at their core. You've already heard from, and we will again have with us on our panel, Mary Kissel. Mary is a member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, and she does a number of different television uh, programs as well. And uh, I think it's, it, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or if it was mentioned earlier, but I think it's well worth noting that when um, Mary was in the uh, Asia Pacific Opinion Editor there, that they were, they were recognized by Amnesty International by, for some of the work that they did. So I think that's uh, very fine indeed. So, and um, then we, I was also speaking in the green room to John Judas, who's with the New Republic, and he's written a number of books um, on William Buckley, among others. He's been a reporter and a senior editor at the New Republic, uh, reporter there since 1984. There you go, right over by Mary. And a senior editor at the New, Repo New Republic since 1994. And um, he, as I said, he has a number of books to his credit. And in particular, and I think relevant to what we're about to talk to, um, is one that he has, The Paradox of American Democracy, Elites, Special Interests, and the Betrayal of Public Trust. Mm. So I think that's uh, very much to what we're talking about today. So I'd like to, if I, if I may, uh, I'll start with you, Ian. I think this is an interesting panel because we're, we're going to be covering some different ground. And when we, when we speak to that issue of common ground, I mean, in a way, you're supposed to be, I guess, nonpartisan. It reminds me a little bit about how eBay is coming out. The founder of eBay is giving $250 million uh, to a new journalism venture. You, as I understand it, have a private philanthropist who's given money to your organization basically to go out and do good things. This is right? That's the short version. Uh, in short, he was a political donor for a large number of years, courtesy of uh, uh, his uh, heritage and backing with the family firm of Transfield. And there isn't a political agenda to this, right? In other words, directly to our point of common ground, you can work with somebody of any political party. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's evidenced by we have former premiers in Nick Greiner and Jeff Gallup, so hopefully those who vote leaning to the left look at Jeff Gallup as a Labor premier and think, mm -hmm. wow, he... he he was good for the party and I trust him. Those who vote leaning to the right see Nick and think he was good for the party. It all goes horribly wrong when those who vote on the left just see Nick and <laughs> gets a little bit back to front. But overwhelmingly, yes, we've tried to assemble a group of former premiers and senators from both sides of politics who say we need to innovate in order to make trusted public decisions because we're not making trusted decisions today. And, was, and, and that's what I want to get to. Was at the core of this a concern that within the media and within the broader political community that there wasn't that kind of cohesion and decision making, that it was too tough to, uh, to get past political disagreements and to get good programs funded and, and in there? Look, certainly I think that we have an unrealist, unrealistic expectation sometimes of what our elected leaders can do. That you may say, well, why didn't they just take that decision? If you needed to get re-elected, re you'd probably take some of the same decisions, and that's what we looked at as the barrier. Why, why do we not take certain decisions? It's because the core goal of getting re-elected can sometimes quite reasonably be a little bit more important than the next policy that comes over the hill. And we need to sort of divorce those two, uh, divorce those two parts. Mary, I wanted to ask you about something that Conrad Black said over lunch, which I found very interesting, and he said that the United States right now is the silly country. And um, when I heard him say that, I thought a lot of people right now are frustrated with what they view as this uh, kind of hectoring 
uh, it's not even conversation anymore. It's just hectoring left and right, and that it's hard to get at the sense of the issues and have a vibrant democracy when everybody's yelling at each other. Do you think that there's something to answer for from um, various political news channels or news channels on the left and on the right you mean in Fox? terms of that? <laughs> Certainly Fox, MSNBC has also been brought into the fray. Yep. Is the way in which we're talking to each other getting in the way of solving problems? Well, I think to a large extent that the tone that you see represents what the American people are, and they are frustrated. They're frustrated on the left and the right. There's a political vacuum in Washington. Uh, you've got an evenly split executive branch and legislative branch, and they're not able to do very much. And I think some of the hectoring, as you say, is a reflection of that frustration. Um, I would push back, however, on the idea that partisanship is necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, it is a good thing to have choice in public policy. Um, and I think the, the problem right now that you see in the media uh, is that they are trying to sort out how to reach their audiences. We talked about this a little bit in the mm -hmm. previous panel. How to reach their audiences, how to convince their audiences that the product they're producing is something that they need to read. But um, there, is, there is serious news happening. Sure. And serious commentary happening. I don't want to downplay that. And even at a channel like Fox, Fox does very serious journalism. Take the 6 p.m. news show. Hmm. Its, its viewership is several times. NBC, sorry. CBS, ABC, why is that? Because they're breaking news and they're doing stories that the public wants to hear about. Nevertheless, John, I know that from the standpoint of what you're seeing now, when we were speaking before, you were saying that the, that the increasing partisanship and the, and the way in which we're talking and the way that reporting is happening, you're actually having some people not returning your calls now. Well, that's, that's true. <laughs> I, uh, I made my mark as an author by writing a biography of Bill Buckley, and it wasn't a it wasn't a partisan biography. It was a attempt to tell the guy's life story through his eyes. It wasn't an attempt to me to to inform people what I thought. And for years, maybe ten you know ten fifteen years, I, I had an easier time getting interviews with conservatives than liberals. I remember having a, there was a left-wing congressman named Ron Dellums from uh, my district where I, when I lived in Berkeley, and it took me like two years to get through to him. Newt Gingrich, you know, walk right in. <laughs> um, and and uh, so anyway, it was, very, it was a very much a different climate in Washington. Now, uh, I'd be lucky, let's say that there's a guy named Steve King, and I, he was thinking about running for uh, president. Or, no, he was going to run for Senate. He's going to run for Senate from Iowa. So I was, was thought, oh, well, I'll do a story on him. I'll follow him around and stuff like that. He's a uh, kind of a Tea Party Republican, uh, very anti-immigrant. I, I couldn't even get the press secretary to return my calls. I mean, I couldn't even get this person to say, I'm sorry, but he doesn't want to see you. And that's so he, he won't even call you to say, experience. I'm not going to talk to you. Yes. There's a, the, and it's, I suppose it's because I come from a liberal magazine, but there used to be much more of a climate, and I, I include the Reagan era. I used to get, get along very well with Pat Buchanan when he was the communications director for, uh, for uh, Reagan. There, there was much more of a give and take. There was much more of a sense of, uh, okay, we're going to argue with you, you know, mm -hmm. about this and that. Now it's just, boom, it's, uh, it's one religion versus another. Very quickly, going back to that, when you talk about Reagan, that makes me think about Lee Atwater. I mean, a strategist, the head of the Republican National Committee, and a man who, when he talked about uh, the Republican Party, interestingly, he talked about, and, and, and by the way, on his watch, some uh, quite interesting uh, ads were done, but, but his philosophy about the Republican Party was the big tent. And that's not as much what, uh, what you see today. There's much more fighting and, and bickering. Do you think, Mary, that part of that, you don't agree with that? You don't well, think there's I, more fighting and bickering? I don't think you can let the smear of the Tea Party stand because the Tea Party also produced Marco Rubio, Kelly Ayotte, very serious people. They did produce some, Kelly some sort of- Kelly Ayotte was not supported by, the La, La Montaigne, her opponent, was supported by the Tea Party in the actual uh, Senate race. She might have gotten some support afterwards, but that's not true. And she's a, she's a moderate in terms now of our politics. Well, let's just step back from it, though, um, because we could debate this for hours. Um, it's, it's a matter there of is fact. A, there it's, is not a, a, <laughs> it's not there a There is debate. a very interesting, I think, I referenced frustration before as a, as a reason for the kind of tone that you hear in the media. 
I think there's an interesting common thread between the Occupy Wall Street movement on the left mm -hmm. and the Tea Party on the right, because they both perceive that there's a growth in connections between Washington and big business, between the regulatory state um, and, and other institutions, and there's a great frustration there, and there's a concern, um, it, which I don't think that you've, you've really seen uh, in recent years in American politics. Um, and so I think, you know, MSNBC is going to cover Occupy Wall Street very closely. Fox will probably cover the Tea Party very closely. Um, but the, the tone that you see of the media, I think, reflects that frustration of the American public. Do you find as well, Ian, with, with the work that you do, obviously you're looking to, um, you know, large organizations and political leaders, but is any of this, is this all trickle down or is some of it trickle up? In other words, are you hearing from people on Twitter about what they think you should do in areas for common ground or is it specifically coming from recognized political uh, leaders in Australia? We invest most of our time talking to elected representatives. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the time people talk through Twitter. They're trying to influence those elected representatives. Exactly. So we do take a little bit of a shortcut. Um, and it was interesting to me as you talked about things in the budgetary area, for example. There's absolutely room for partisanship and different ideas where people can compete. We have a position that maybe we've got to a point where the first elected leader, if a Democrat proposes a solution, it must meet. Electorally, the Republicans must meet it with an immediate response of why it won't work, and vice versa. As the uh, Republicans try to lay something or the Tea Party lay something, there is an immediate default response. The agenda of what can be discussed has become impossibly narrow, mm -hmm. and it's a case of how can we land an a set of ideas for there for discussion that instead of them having a label, that both parties have to respond to them neutrally rather than responding to the label of who's put the idea so out So in other there. words, you're saying you're contending so narrow that it's hard to get things done and therefore you have to have uh, an organisation such as yours step in to fill the breach. I think the organisation such as ours sits because a, a previous speaker mentioned 7% support for Congress. We've seen similar numbers here in Australia. People don't really love how we're making public decisions today and that's, that's the gap we're trying to fit. Imagine seeing a public decision made where the bulk of the community said, I trust that, that looks like the right decision. We're not seeing a great deal of that. Let me go back to you, John, for just a minute. I know one of the things that you talk about and you address in one of your books is that while there's always been partisanship, and I agree that that's an important part of the process, it's changed, hasn't it? And it was a different um, landscape, certainly in the United States, and I dare, dare say here in Australia, in terms of who was running the show and how politics was run. Uh, if you go back a little bit in history. What's changed in your view and what are the risks because of those changes? Well, the, the, let me put it partly in terms of the media because that's what this conference is mm -hmm. supposed to be about. But uh, uh, America was founded with the idea that there would be a disinterested elite. Not, disinterested is not the same as uninterested. It means above faction, party, interest, and later class. Looking in terms of the national interest who would mediate uh, the... the uh, decisions, po the popular democratic decisions, because they had greater access to knowledge, maybe they were wiser and more virtuous, but uh, uh, again, they would play this critical role. And I think that that was true in our founding. It was first certainly true for the first tw 10, 20 years. Broke down Jacksonian era, broke, mm -hmm. breaks down completely in the Civil War. Afterwards, we get a kind of era of uh, everything goes. Progressive era, you get the reassertion of this same kind of disinterested elite. And that's, that's the period when you get the New York Times, the Washington Post. The New York Times existed before, but you get this idea of a different kind of newspaper that is going to try to cover the news and provide people with a kind of global understanding of what's going on in the world so they can make decisions. All the news that's fit to print yes. is famously the, on the master. And the, the, but similarly with the Washington Post when Meyer takes over in, in the 30s, and you get think tanks like Brookings that have that same kind of ideal. It's not, again, an ideal that, that they're not going to make judgments about things. They're, they're going to have opinions, but they're going to try to rise above the party struggle, the faction. That's broken down to a great extent in the last 40 years. Uh, you know, if you want me to go into well, why, but the... But, you know, at the end of the day, we really in the United States now have only one national news source that embodies that idea, which is the New York Times. And I'm not saying the other, uh, 
No, I'm not saying the other, you know, TV is bites and stuff. I'm saying for an informed citizenry that wants to make decisions about what to do, especially about foreign policy. Most people don't know what the, you know, the trade balance with China is and stuff like that. You have to have some resort to this, this, this area of expertise. The New York Times is just about it, and that's a tragedy as far as I'm concerned. Where it used to be many other sources. It used to be a, a you know, a company. I'm going to let Mary respond. I'm going to let Mary respond because I hear it coming out. <laughs> yeah. It's bubbling out. Go well, ahead, Mary. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, look, I respect the New York Times and the Washington Post and these great titles. Yeah. If they were providing quality news that people needed to read, you're would, saying the New York Times is not providing quality news. I'm saying it's the Wall Street Journal is the number one publication in America for a reason because is number people, one the same as quality? People, uh, are you a I mean, moderator? No, 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 or are you not, on not a, a, a no. I'm here. curious, <laughs> but are we saying? I'm just trying to make sure that I understand you on the New York uh, Times. Are we saying it's a quality well, organization? No, uh, that's or why not? I prefaced my remarks by saying I respect the New York Times and the Post as titles. They have wonderful reporters. They do very high quality work. But you have to ask, uh, you know, in the last panel, when you heard those circulation numbers for the Washington Post, why have they been halved in the last couple of years? That's a very serious mm -hmm. decline. And I don't think it's good for democracy. I think you need vibrant publications. You need vibrant competition. I think that, uh, look, uh, I, I, I simply don't agree that the Times is the newspaper of, of record. Um, if it were, people would be buying it and reading it, and they're simply not. They're not providing the kind of breaking news, quality analysis. If they were, everyone would be buying you it. You make a really interesting point in the article that uh, was included with our, our packet here about um, a reporter going to the New York Times and saying, what is in, and this is a few years ago, what's in this paper that happened today? That happened today. Is that part of the problem that we need to change, that, you know, that this, that this uh, influx of new media and the way in which media's coverage is changing is a response to, tell us what's happening right now. We want to know, we're in instant age. We need to know what's happening right now. But competition is a good thing. Americans Definitely. are more informed than they ever were before. I completely, respectfully, disagree that we need an elite telling us what to do. I think the beauty of new media is that it's allowing readers to tell us what's important to them, what matters, uh, what they care about, who's doing a good job reporting it, who isn't. Um, I'm sorry. No, I just want, I see Ian jump again and I want to follow up on that. Yes? I think, and I, it came out a little bit out of your point, that there can be a view that the media is essential to an informed citizenry and there's almost a, a prejudice that high quality information is at the core of our democracy. And I think that's where, to some extent, a range of newspapers have been outsmarted by a political class of advisors who realise that the core of democracy is, is getting voters to hate your opponent more. And that is a different story to tell than doing very in-depth pieces, where there is, of course, but room for it. That's always been true. You've always had negative ads. You have negative ads because they work. Absolutely. Since, since the beginning of American democracy, you've had negative advertising. Well, I'm just this laughing. I'm just, I was going to say, I was, I was very interested when I was over in the States um, just this last couple of weeks. I took my 12-year-old daughter on a bit of a history tour. We went to Boston, and there was a fascinating little moment where they were talking about Sam Adams, you know, one of the founders of the American Revolution, and how he spun a couple of guys being shot into the Boston Massacre. So, you know, the point was made on this tour that, that there has been a level of, um, you know, political intrigue and spin from the very beginning. That said, it certainly changed in the years that I've been a journalist. There's certainly more options, there are more outlets, and it does seem that there's more acrimony. Do you believe that that's the case? No, I, I don't really? see that choice is bad. I Ch think choice th is good. That's not to say that choice is bad, but I'm, th there's Look, choice and availability and acrimony. It may, maybe this will fill in the gap. I'm not saying experts should tell us what to do, but they fill in certain gaps of our knowledge that we don't otherwise get. One of the things that's eroded this role that this interested elites played in democracy is the, uh, the onset of a, a very aggressive business uh, 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 lobbying in Washington that begins in the 70s, where, and that's really when people start talking about Washington as a evil place in the capital. And uh, one effect of that has been to transform the role of think tanks. Think tanks go back to the you know, early part of the century. Uh, and they were, again, they were a voice of dispassionate elites, even though in some respects the people who, who ran them were conservatives. But if the report said one thing, it was going to be published. 
and I give you examples. Brookings once, in 1928, they had a, a laissez-faire Republican as the head of it, and he commissioned a report on the railroads, and it said we should nationalize the railroads, and the, the funders of Brookings said, we, you know, don't publish this, and he insisted on publishing it. What's happened to a great extent in Washington now is that you have so-called think tanks that are disguised lobbies, either for business or for partisan political ends. And I include things like the Center for American uh, Progress, which is a democratic uh, think tank that was developed in, partly on the model of heritage. So you get a show, let's say you get the News Hour, and you get, which is a, you know, a good venue for, uh, for trying to figure out what to do, what you think about something. And you get these experts introduced, but they're not, in fact, simply experts on the subject. They're, they're, they also they have an agenda. Well, and, uh, to, and that's the problem. It's, it's a it's corruption first, of... First Amendment rights. I mean, this is the competition of ideas. I think it's terrific. Look, I do think there is a, a, a responsibility as a professional journalist to always yeah. identify who you're speaking to, what their interests are, <laughs> To, uh, to, to educate the audience about who's speaking and what's their point of view for sure. But the proliferation of think tanks on the left and the right has been a, a terrific addition to our democracy and it's exactly what the founders intended. Let me ask you this, Mary. Some people have been saying that they believe that as a result of watching the, one channel or now, another. The oh, founders did not even believe in parties. They would have found something like heritage or you know the Center for American Progress, just loony. It was totally outside their their, their conception of how politics was going to be discussed. And they really did think about above faction, above interest. So it's not... Who are, it's these, not, who are these elites that should tell us what the news is and what to No, think? no, that's a different point. I'm making a historical point about what the... You said the founders. The founders did not think that we should have we should have institutions that represent parties that then represent themselves on, let's say, TV as dispassionate experts. And that's part of the problem that we have right now in the country in terms of the discussion and debates we have. So that's, what, that's, that's all. I'm so giving us the historical context. Just yeah. to go to the, to the question, though, of when people watch television, because I think there's another element here in addition to this, which is that what, what some of the studies have shown is that when people watch a particular network yeah. for a while, they, almost start, they, they, they become somewhat hardened in their positions and their thinking on that. And there are various ones. Um, there's a study that shows that um, pe viewers who watch Fox News are much less likely to believe climate change, that there is climate change. Well, there isn't climate. Then, I mean, that, that, that's, I mean you've, you've basically shown your hand. I'm not, I'm not making an I agenda. Mean, I'm saying I, I, I mean, you, you have scientists from MIT and Princeton uh, debating that. It's a debate. So you're saying, OK. <laughs> uh, the question isn't whether or not it's man-made, but whether or not the, cl the, the uh, planet is getting warmer. You're, you're there, making all my points for me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last 10 years, it hasn't gotten warmer. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the science of climate change to one side. No, but your point the, about point I'm making people, is, the point I'm making is that people who watch a particular channel yeah. are believing what that position is, be it on the right or on the left. Mm. And they're not as open to uh, other points of view. And this has been made, this has been a point that has been made quite broadly, this being one, the climate change example being one example. People getting hardened, ossified in a position by watching one channel. Now, do you believe that that is part of, the, part of what's happening? And is that bad for the common ground? Is that bad for trying to then cross over uh, our political disagreements mm -hmm. and make things happen? Because clearly, in Washington at least, there are some problems there. There's actually a lot of bipartisanship in Washington, but this isn't the subject of this panel. Um, uh, Charles Murray of the American Enterprise Institute has written a lot about how the common cultural experience of America has changed, that everything Americans heard on television and did for fun in the 50s, they had a kind of a common experience, and that's really not true anymore. Um, it, it, just, just, as a, just as a side note, if you're interested in the topic, it's a great, he's a great guy to read on it. Um, it in terms of believing what you read, um, I think there's a kind of paternalism that comes with talking about, well, the people who watch Fox News or the people who watch MSNBC, they can't possibly understand that there are different points of view. I think that really underestimates the intelligence of the average American 
or European or Australian or whoever it is that is, that is consuming the news. Um, you know, there is a, quite a bit of, of, of choice out there. If they're choosing to watch Fox News or they're choosing to watch MSNBC, it's because they're getting information and or analysis, because it's important to note that these channels aren't just opinion. No, they are news, news organizations and they break a lot of news that they're not getting somewhere else. So I don't worry at all if Fox is attracting 50% and MSNBC is attracting the other 50%. They're competing, um, uh, and they're competing uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a space which is far more competitive than it is in this country. Yeah, to some extent, Ian? it's a, also a comment on survey methodology. If you ask people a short, closed question, mm -hmm. then you get short, closed answers, mm -hmm. possibly commissioned by someone who'd really like to make the point about mm -hmm. partisanship. In our work with elected representatives, um, after they get over the initial appeal of, well, I might get a photo op with you know, a couple of former premiers, this looks really good, there's always a follow-up question. When I do this jury of yours, and bear it on, we're not topic specific. It can be about energy, it can be about local government budgets, uh, crime as we've just done. But there'll be a lean in question. Am I gonna get a, a Sydney Morning Herald view or am I gonna get a Daily Telegraph view? Which way are people gonna fall? And it's always the question. And it's very much assumes that there's two paths to fall. And consistently, because we give people time and access to information, it fits neither. And that's where it was, it was interesting to me just listening to a um, clearly two different points of view with regards to energy. We did an energy inquiry here in New South Wales and people landed views that have not been represented in any media outlet, be they the Telegraph or, or the Herald, and they go to a different path. And it comes down to a lot of, I wouldn't say conditionality, but actually looking at shades of grey. Mm -hmm. And our political system, magnified by the media, is not fantastic at shades of grey. Would you agree with that, Mary? Well, I, I just wanted to, to make a comment about partisanship because I get the sense from the panel that, you, or you, I mean, you might get the sense in the audience that America is this sort of hyper-partisan place where no one agrees. Um, we've had a number of bipartisan agreements. Simpson Bowles in 2010 on the budget, uh, Camp Wyden, um, uh, Camp Baucus on taxes, uh, Ryan Wyden on Medicare, Rubio, the Gang of Eight, and immigration reform. These are four major, major bipartisan deals that are, are ready and, and waiting to be done. So I just they're wanted to, ready to put and that. Ready to not be done. That's well, the, the problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, not, but, just, but, just to make, but just to make the point yes, that there, there, there is bipartisanship. They're scattering in, in uh, bipartisanship, but it's a, it's a problem. There isn't, none of this thing, there's not going to be immigration reform in, in the United States. I, I, I would be happy if there were, but. Uh, me too. Not, one of the things that interests me. Do we agree? One of the yeah. things that interests me on this panel, and obviously it, yeah. it, this is, uh, I think, true in Australia as well. Some of what we're talking about is, is obviously uh, uh, more limited or, or specific to America. But one thing that I think that, is, that affects all of us as working journalists is that our sources of information are just far broader than they have ever yeah. been before. I mean, you've got all of the kind of uh, citizen uh, journalism with a small j, but I think is incredibly important, bubbling up from places like Twitter and, and all sorts of online situations. What, what, how, much, how does that fit into um, this debate? Because to me, that's something that's exciting to see uh, the Arab Spring unfold live on your on your Twitter feed, to to see the ways to have the, the you know the terrible things that happened in the Boston Marathon or the Arab Spring, but to be able to know what was happening and be up to date uh, because of uh, technological advances. How does that change the playing field? Does it make it less? Does it make room for common ground? The purpose of this debate, or does it make it harder to achieve? Uh, just, let me say two opposing things. On the for, on the one hand, absolutely, <laughs> it does. It, it's very important for politics. It creates a kind of virtual community that mm -hmm. didn't exist. In the, in the United States, the uh, la labor movement, uh, my, my side of the political spectrum, has gotten weaker and weaker. And to a great extent, it's been replaced by organizations like MoveOn.org, which are, it was actually started by two computer people from uh, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, and it's, a, it's a virtual community. And the same thing happens with the right. That, 
it all started with Ross Perot, who understood this stuff. Not to the same stuff. extent. More successfully on the left than yeah. on the right. So that's all good, and it's interactive, and it's it's uh, it's. I like talk radio from that sense because people get to talk mm -hmm. each other. But in terms of providing expertise, understanding of what's going on, very imperfect medium. And I, I'll even use my own example for it because uh, when I write for the New Republic, if you if you read the piece that I did for the magazine. That went through like seven or eight drafts. It went through a fact checker. Mm -hmm. And the fact checkers, since the era of Steve Glass, they are really a pain in the ass at the New Republic. And I mean, <laughs> I mean that as a compliment. I mean, you know, so they really... So in other really, words, something on the internet is not going to have and when anywhere I write for close the, to... And when I write for the internet, it, it pretty much, you know, commas, semicolons and stuff, boom, right through. And, 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 but that's a, so, but I know the subject somewhat but, that I'm writing on, but still I make mistakes. If you extend that to the kind of discussion that goes on, it's, it's you know, it's a real mess. And you get, you get kind of crazy stuff going on. And so even on the Internet, there has to be, if we're going to go electronic, the, my argument repeats itself. Again, there has to be some way of people getting information and news that they can trust, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. That's Let me ask I mean. one other question, Mary, because I want to ask you this. In terms of, I mean, we've talked a lot about politics, but anybody who watches any degree of television knows that's not all that we're covering. And a lot of what we're covering, to get back to the silly comment, a lot of what we're covering isn't increasingly isn't that important. I mean, if you go well, and check to, it, According to whom? Oh, I think that's a fair question. According to me, for the purpose of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having an opinion here. Um, but what I mean is, if you... We're covering a lot of... Um, and I mean this in the most global sense, when I talk about media broadly. If you go and you check out online, if you check out all the sites, there's a lot of coverage of what's happening in Hollywood. It's a very nice place. I was just there. It's exciting. I love Hollywood movie stars, too. But what I'm saying is that for our, our purpose of, of common ground, uh, you know, in the old days, there was a half hour in the evening, and I personally am glad that we have more available than that. But are we doing a good enough job collectively as we look at ourselves? Are we doing as well as we can? do to cover the important things as well as some of the lighter things? Is well, everybody comfortable with where we are on this? I, I, I don't know. I kind of enjoy the Kardashians from time to time. I don't <laughs> think there's anything, you know, particularly wrong with that. It's an it's, uh, escape for me, and that's fun. Or um, uh, the, the desperate, you know, the, the housewives of New Jersey, the, the now criminal housewives of New Jersey. <laughs> Um, but that's not but, the kind of stuff you cover. I mean, you're a serious reporter. I think, reporter. look, I think there's, there's room for everything in the media space. Um, you don't uh, think it's skewed? In other words, because you're a very fine, serious reporter, so you don't think there's a little bit too much going on of the silly season, if you will, and some of the lighter things? Or you're comfortable with how much news time is devoted to all of that? Well, I, I, look, I think that this, this landscape is in transition. I think you'll have uh, some outlets, for example, there's something called uh, the, the IRS tax blog, right? And he breaks a lot of news regarding the IRS, and there's a place for him, and it's for serious people, and he's not going to have five million hits a day. Um, but he may very well influence um, media outlets and politicians because he is breaking important news. Um, you'll have People Magazine, you know, that you continue to read the, doc the doctor's office. There's, there's, there's room for that. I don't think that the proliferation of news that you can enjoy, um, like I enjoy, um, it necessarily means that, that journalism, p journalists aren't doing serious work. I, th I think they are. Oh, I think there's lots of serious work. I'm just questioning what the, what the ratios are and what we're, what we're seeing the most of. Go ahead. I think, I, I mean, from, firstly, from an Australian perspective, where it may not have the same depth and range of titles as you see in the United States, but I come from the perspective of trying to, frankly, play stories, trying to find media interest, and the interest always zones in on what's controversial, what's personal, and it's not about the substance. Actually trying to get something covered in, this is what it is, is less interesting than which advisor? What did the representative say? This must have really pushed someone else off. And I think everyone's passion for the Kardashians and the Desperate Housewives well, has come across yeah, into but, the main but, story. But news is a product, ultimately. And you, know, you, have to, you have to explain to people who are very busy, by the way, who, who, who now have you know, jobs and Blackberries and families and things, you have to explain to them well, why is it that you need to read this story? Why is it important to you? And you need to do it quickly, and you need to do it at the top of a story or at the top of a broadcast. I just think it's, uh, it, it's almost a, 
in, in today's world, you can't expect, for example, someone to say, well, you're an elite, you're at PBS, and I just, you must listen to what I have to say. No, you have to convince people to listen to what you say. John? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to another question. I, I watch sports mainly, so it's hard to be, I don't even, you know, I, I find uh, the MSNBC and, and uh, Fox things to be echo chambers, so. And a lot of people say this of Twitter as well. You know, they say that people Twitter, who get their get Twitter feeds, to, they get lost yeah. in their own little, you know, Twitter universe of you're hearing back right. the, you know, the you're selecting um, the people you're following uh, the, the, and what you The you're other here. thing I would bring, bring up uh, two two other things. The, the one development that's really been important is the transformation of these media conglomerates into profit centers. I mean, they used to have, they used to have these family newspapers, and they used to be kind of, they weren't vanity op, uh, uh, operations because they actually made money, uh, and they made money from, class, you know, the story classifieds and all, all that. Right. But uh, now there really is much more emphasis on, on uh, making a buck. That's contributed to the Washington Post becoming much more local and less of an international newspaper. Uh, that that's a big factor in uh, in what's happened to to the media. Um, I, I don't know what the solution. I tend to to eventually. I think eventually the government's going to have to step in in some way and subsidize the kind of publication that I would like to see. I, I don't. I, 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 and see, that is to say, yeah. a publication that had a global reach that, that corresponded to the interests that Americans themselves had. Something that akin, are you, saying, are you saying something in the United States akin to the ABC or the BBC? Is that what you're talking so, about? Something? something like that. I think eventually that's, that's, that's what I would see as a solution because the other direction, the development of these public companies, uh, the, the, the Zell and the New Chicago Tribune and the LA Times, it's just a tragedy what's, what's happened as a result of that. That's really meant the disintegration of uh, all the, you know, what used to be, we used to have like, you know, 10 great newspapers in the United States. So we, we don't anymore. I don't know. I, I've never understood the logic of saying we need a government watchdog, so we should have government fund it. It's like saying we need um, a food regulator to oversee McDonald's. Let's have McDonald's pay for that. They'll so never truly be independent. It's absolutely impossible. And if you look at the political leanings of the ABC and the BBC, they lean to the left. They may not lean as much to the left as MSNBC, but they certainly have a point of view. And you will never have true independence in a true watchdog, the kind of watchdog that our founders protected in the Constitution, if you have government involvement. That's my point of view. If, that's that's it, the dilemma. And let me ask you a but, question. I want to ask all three yeah. of you quickly. Do you think just off the top of your head, yes or no, is um, news coverage as fair, as balanced, as good as it was 20 years ago? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, <laughs> again, I, I'm just struck by how, how I don't get anything out of the LA Times, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, McClatchy was the main source of news about, the, about the, what was really happening with the Iraq war buildup. Those, those sources. So you're have, missing voices I'm missing, out there. I'm missing uh, uh, voices. Now it's just mm. a few. Mary? Um, better, worse, the same as it was I think 20 it's years a, ago? I think it's a lot better because there's just so much more choice. Um, you may not have the McClatchy reporter in Iraq, but you can access Twitter feeds of Iraqis on the ground and um, you know, Facebook pages and blogs. And there's, you, know, you, you, you really, we are so much better informed today than we were 20 years ago. And, and, and people have choice. And I believe that that's uh, absolutely wonderful and sh should be celebrated. It is what you make of it. You can read narrowly if, you, if that's your choice and be as self-selective as you choose, or you can invert that self-selectivity and read impossibly broadly at virtually no cost. And do you have any way of knowing how many people are doing which? I mean, I mean, I'm so interested by this. What do you think most people are doing from the, you, you have this interesting perspective of kind of being in the middle. From those you talk to on both sides, do you, what do you hear? I think the population is far less partisan than is portrayed. When you see opinion mm -hmm. polls, we have a view that opinion polls will be the page three girls of our era. We'll look back and say, I, I really can't <laughs> believe we did that every day. It's kind of cute, but not every day, a little too much. Um, when you actually look at it, it's a very quickly, you take any issue, are you for it or against it? What a ridiculous way to approach almost any question in your life. And you think it's important to have uh, organizations like this that say, let's get past that 
and try and solve something. We've had a, a great comment was made by an advisor in the Premier's office who said, you know, on most issues of government policy, if we take a decision, it would help four million people and seven people will lose. And you know what happens? It's those seven people who are really, really motivated to get the best advisors, the best PR people and get their story out. And a media that is striving to be objective tries to show both sides of the question. They don't actually show the tilt that in some cases there's absolutely an activist side, and that, that's on any issue. We contend that our democracy, look at the range of views, it's like a bell curve. And who do we hear from? We hear from the two ends. Government absolutely has to take this decision. The world will end if government takes this decision. All we're saying is the voices across here, they're out there if you want to find them, but maybe they just don't sell quite as well as these voices. And that, that's what actually goes through to government, and that's the problem to be focused on. When we had the last election, I know you're probably across this, Mary, when we had this last uh, election here in Australia for Prime Minister, I mean, there were various people who were saying, you know, this is the most acrimonious, the most personal mm. uh, election that we've had in some time. Uh, what's your take on that? Um, well, Australian politics has always been kind of a blood sport, which is why it's so much fun to follow. Um, I love watching the parliamentary debates. They're fantastic. Um, you know, it, it, you have a true competition of ideas here. You, have, you really do have two sides, and people really do have a choice. Was it overly acrimonious? No. Um, I think it is largely a civilized debate at the end of the day, like it is in our country, for all of the hyper-partisan uh, um, uh, statements. Uh, you know, ultimately, you have an election and you have a peaceful transfer of power. I mean, this is one of the great democracies that the world has ever seen here in Australia. And I think people who participated in it are quite lucky to be here. And what about us? What about the United States? How do you think our uh, political system is doing in terms of you know, the changing nature of the media who are reporting what happens in our political campaigns? Is, that, uh, is the way in which campaigns are being covered and uh, the various news media outlets which are available to cover the process changing who gets elected? Oh, I don't know how much they ever changed who, you mean who gets elected? Yeah. I, I don't know how much influence the media has on that. I think they are, more, may, they mainly reflect mm. rather than determine. And uh, what do you think they're reflecting right now in the United States? What do you, see, what do you think the media <laughs> no, reflects I about the, the media. <laughs> but you can I mean, what, hold what the are you mirror up. Me? What, do you think, what do you think it reflects about us, what we're seeing? Um, in, what is in going Washington? on now mm -hmm. in the United States? It's a, um, the, the country's in very bad shape. We can't make fundamental decisions. And uh, I, I, I attribute it to a few things. Uh, first, uh, the absence of a common enemy that brings us together, like we had in World War II and during the Cold War. I think that that's contributed to a fragmentation and to a willingness of people just to go their, go their own ways. Um, the second thing that we have, the problem particularly now, is a kind of... A, uh, an anti-statism that we've had since mm. the uh, revolution, since uh, the idea of the government as a necessary evil. And uh, that, that's been a part of the American consciousness and when we have problems, comes to the fore suddenly as the solution, as the, as the uh, you know, as the, uh, as the reason we're having the problems when in fact, you know, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the reason we're in economic trouble now has been an unwillingness to, um, run larger deficits to spend more. I'm, I'm, a, I'm on the Keynes School of, uh, of Economics, and uh, I think our experience in the 20s and 30s uh, showed it to be correct. And, and so now we have a situation where we uh, have a very lagging recovery. Uh, we have a very strong anti-government movement that's uh, saying that we shouldn't do anything. So uh, that creates a, kind of, a, a very bad situation for the country because people then blame the people in charge. We're going to, you know, maybe we'll get Republicans in 2016 if they do the same thing that, you know. It, I compare it a lot to Japan from 1990 to, to uh, even to, to now and the kind of turnover, the inability to, to resolve uh, uh, may, uh, underlying problems. So yes, I think that um, the country is not in good shape. All right, we now get an opportunity for you all to weigh in on this discussion, and um, I've had my opinions, and I look forward to hearing some of yours and some of your questions. Just come to the microphone, and we'll ask you. Yes, go right ahead and tell us who you are as well. Hello, Siobhan McHugh, University of Wollongong. Apparently, we're here in a, a building that was designed by a Danish architect, Jørgen Utzon, 
fabulous man, and apparently Denmark is the happiest country in the world. <laughs> a fact that is, I think, not unconnected with the fact that they have the greatest social parity. They have the least amount of disjunction between rich and poor. Sociologists can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's true. America, on the other hand, has one of the, the biggest disparities of income um, that we know about, and it's increasing the, the, the level of CEO payments versus the level of the have-nots. Now, this is a theme that David Simon engages with, having given up on journalism and gone to television drama to engage with it. Where does the panel think that this issue of inequality should lie in media discussions? It hasn't been raised yet today that I'm aware of. Inequality in terms, in, in terms of, you mean in terms of covering inequalities in America? Is that what you mean? I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Covering social justice issues, covering financial inequalities, covering okay. tax rorts, covering all those issues of income I think there's, discrepancy. I actually think there's a, a fair bit of good reporting in the United States from, from the Journal, from NBC, from, from others in terms of... Um, that kind of that kind of issue. We, with the we rest cover of the it. The problem is doing something about it, and that's a, that's a totally <laughs> that's uh, not our job. That's a different <laughs> kettle of fish, and that's not uh, that again. Uh, you can blame that somewhat on the you know bad coverage by the media, but I think it is more uh, intimidation by the uh, financial elites. You, you can look at what's happening now in uh, France, where they have socialist government, right? And uh, one of the guy, one of the things they came to power on was this idea of a transaction tax, a, a ta an added tax on uh, stock, stock transactions. And Olan was, that was one of the things he was committed to, but now he's in power and uh, he's getting a lot of pressure and, and he himself is backing down. Sim you know, similar things happened to Clinton in the first, first term, Obama. It's very hard for us to do anything uh, uh, about equality in the country. Well, so, and it's not the, it's not, I don't think it has, a, it has to do so much with the media. Yeah. Look, if you want perfect income equality, you'd be a great supporter of North Korea and the former Soviet Union. Um, you know, from the editorial page perspective, um, there is quite a bit of coverage of income inequality in the States. You would go to a place like the New York Times to read about things like social justice, um, CEO pay, that, that kind of issue. You'd probably come to our editorial page to read about income mobility, which is the opportunity to go from being very poor to being middle class or, or to being very... Um, wealthy, and I would say that that's, you know, covering that kind of issue, how easy is it to rise in America or in Australia, um, far more important than deciding who should sit in government and decide who should get what handout. Um, yes, another question? Um, Mary, um, Hi. you're ten times more beautiful, but have you heard of Miranda Devine? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I don't know her, but I've, I've, I've definitely read her, yes. If you do meet her, um, please don't talk to her too much. Some of you might rub off on her and then we'll all be sunk. But uh, my question... My goodness, do you not like me, sir? We've no. never met. We've never <laughs> met. <laughs> Look, your, your use of the word choice, there's 85 varieties of choice in our supermarkets, but if you're, you're, if you're one of Siobhan's underclass, you can't afford to buy any of them, but we won't go there. My question relates to... Frames in the media. Peter Watkins did the war game back in 1961 and then he did the journey in 1976, which showed that the average TV news frame shrunk from 15 seconds per frame down to three and a half seconds mm. per frame. So people's attention span went from yeah. that down to that in, over, in the decade of the 1970s. And... In response to that, Ken Davidson, the former editor of The Age, said that the average column in our newspapers has shrunk from a, a, a journal-sized newspaper down to a tabloid size with bigger headlines, bigger photos and smaller articles. Now, this partially explains why two times the number of people are watching Fox TV, their concentration span is shot to ribbons and they're understanding far less than they did in, in, back in the 70s, when the St. Louis Dispatch had wonderful articles on the Iraq War, which incidentally, 3,000 pages 
a day were coming out from Iraqi war soldiers on the ground resisting and not wanting to be involved in the, in the war any further, but none of it was being published by the American media. So you can go on about twittering now, Iraq on the ground, but twittering was you know occurring what? back I, then. I, I this, is my, this is my rhetorical yeah. question. I, can we have some truth or is this the sinking deck of the Titanic while the masses are rising underneath it? Well, well, you know what? I appreciate that in this free debate we have an opportunity to make opinions and statements as well as ask questions. And let's go on to our next person and we'll have a question. Uh, yes, we yes. heard a fair share of uh, bashing with the ABC here today, which I'm not too happy about because I quite like the ABC. I think they provide a first-class news service. So I can't imagine the sort of in quality, investigative, balanced journalism appearing anywhere in the Murdoch press, quite frankly. Uh, but my question is, following on from that, is, is there not a very strong public goods component to the news? And the sort of news that the public broadcasts, the ABC, this quality, balanced, investigative journalists, without fear or favour, would not, simply not be produced by the commercials. Because what economists call public goods, and this news type of news service is a public good and it would simply not be produced by the private sector so they're not crowding out mm -hmm. the, 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 the private sector which is used as an argument uh, and many economists would not hold to that argument, I'm an economist myself, but, but so would you care to uh, comment on that? I'll I'll start with, we'll I'd start with John if we could, something. yes. Um, I, we've had these arguments in the New Republic about whether the government should fund uh, the national public radio. I mean, it's a, it goes on in the United States. My, uh, my, I, I have a long-winded answer to it, which uh, goes back to my Marxist background, which is the idea of uh, survivals. Family is a survival of er earlier modes of production. The idea of a patron comes out of feudal Europe, Elizabethan Europe. Artists had to have patrons. They couldn't exist. Otherwise, the government serves that role in modern capitalism, um, in, especially in the arts. But I think also, again, it could serve that role in terms of the dissemination of news. It does that somewhat uh, subsidizing postal rates and things like that. But I think there's going to be other ways in which it does it. And I'm not going to deny that Mary has a point about, uh, again, about the government controlling uh, what, what's put out and corroding this public, undermining this public good. But I think that there's an argument, just as there's an argument to be made for the public support, for government support of the arts, I think there's an argument to be made for, for news as a public good and that it's something that will have to be supported by the government. So that's my, that's a long-winded response, sorry. And I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Would you like to, or we, would anybody else like to offer? I'm getting the double bell. <laughs> um, it, you know, in television, it's like this, and then it's like this. And I think that's what we could just got. Listen, thank you all very much. I enjoyed having the opportunity to talk to our wonderful panel, and thank you for joining us. Who is that person? Thank you.